good, good. Yes, so welcome to local council accounting from zero to hero. So that's the process we're going to take you through today. Uh, my name is John Fagan and I am the CEO here at Scribe. So I'd like to introduce you uh, to Hannah. Hannah has been with us for uh, quite a few years from when we first acquired Scribe as a business and started growing it. So she's been with us from for five years, been talking and supporting loads and loads of customers uh, from small parishes to big town councils. What she doesn't know about managing accounting at local councils is not worth knowing. So um, I'm going to be handing over to you now, Hannah, to uh, Thank you, talk. Thank you, Hannah. Great, let's share my screen with you all. There we go, lovely, hope you can all see that and hear me okay. So thanks, John. Um, yes, so today, local council accounts from zero to hero. So the idea of today is a bit of an introduction to local council accounting. Maybe if you're maybe new or maybe your numbers isn't your favorite place to be, accounts isn't your strong point, or a bit of a refresher because local council accounting is quite different to commercial accounting. So if you've got a bit of a commercial business accounts background, it can be quite different getting used to those, those differences. And just in understanding them as well. So four sections for today. First is a little bit of an introduction to council accounting, the importance, the considerations and then what, what your role of the RFO is. Good procedures for keeping accounting records. Looking a bit at that because that's often something that comes up quite a few questions coming to us at Scribe about VAT. And then since we are in May, and I'm likely that some of you certainly are still going through the year end process, and that was something that came up in the poll as well, we'll have a little look at um, some year end stuff as well, particularly the numbers part of the ACAR, so the accounting statements, and some considerations um, as we think about that as well. So firstly then, a bit of an introduction to local council accounting, so taking it back to basics, thinking about what it is, why it's important, and what the considerations therefore are. I've defined a parish or town council so interchangeable um, in this respect as an elected body at the first level of local government, making decisions on behalf of the parish with a wide range of powers relating to local matters. So I'm not really clear there, but what that actually means in terms of accounting, obviously in order to do provide these services, um, is taking the precept and therefore there's that link with your electors and the precept and um, those paying the precept and the importance of them understanding and seeing what's going on and you making good decisions so the council's having information and making informed decisions about what the council should be doing when and in the most appropriate way. Considerations therefore obviously transparency so you have to be transparent you have to publish agendas minutes obviously the year ends that you're working on now likely will need to go on your website of course and so it's important to be completely transparent obviously if you're holding public funds then you need to be as clear as you can about those things and just then be as transparent as you can be obviously in order to do that you need to hold good accurate financial information to be able to be transparent in terms of accounting matters efficient provision of services so obviously exists to provide services for your parish local area, whether it be grass cutting, street lighting, whatever it may be. So it's thinking mostly about the precept. Is the precept that you're taking an appropriate amount at the end of the year? Do you, is, has you been able to provide all the relevant services? You don't want to have a budget, huge budget surplus at the end of the year. If you, if you haven't got a specific thing you're going to be doing with that, obviously that relates to reserves. If you're saving up for a certain project, that's absolutely fine. But if you're finding yourself that you're taking a certain precept and actually you're not spending it all, that's an issue. And equally, if your precept isn't enough and then you're having issues with providing the services that you need to, and there's a shortfall, then you don't really want to have huge fluctuations from year on year with the precept that you're taking. So again, so important to have good financial information in terms of actuals versus budgets, allowing you to forecast, and therefore to set an appropriate precept. So setting the precept as we talked about there and then thinking about those reserves as well. So there are a few people at the start who felt reserves were difficult to manage and obviously you've got to have, be very clear on why you're holding reserves, what those reserves you know, for, is it a specific project, are you 
building a play park, are you refurbishing the village hall, whatever it may be, or are you holding those things to it fluct um, to flatten out your budget in terms of the placement of items every so many years. So you need to be again clear about that, how that then affects the budget and the precept and taking money to put into your reserve pot and understanding that so that you're not ending in a situation where you've got a lot of money sitting in the bank account without a clear um, structure and, and plan for it. So for you personally then, as the RFO and the Cosme RFO. So every local authority is required to appoint an officer responsible for the administration of their council's financial affairs. So that's the RFO, to be a paid employee of the council and thinking about some of the responsibilities that you therefore have. So firstly, in terms of following proper financial procedures and internal control and audit systems. So all the things that you're probably thinking about now as you go through the AGAR process and ticking off those boxes in the annual governance and the internal auditors come to review some of those controls, et cetera, to allow you to say hopefully yes to those assertions and thinking about how you deal with petty cash or how your payment process works, how payroll is done, how you um, manage sort of the procedures and the, and the control systems that you have within the, the council itself. Obviously, absolutely important to report to the council on your spending in the current position. So thinking about that previous slide and making informed decisions, providing efficient services, setting the budget and therefore the precept relies so heavily on having good financial information. If you can provide budget versus actuals so you can see where you are, what's going on, then obviously that's absolutely key. And of course, you need to complete the AGAR so as you sure you're all very well aware of at the moment um, at year end 31st of March you need me to complete the ACAR that we'll talk about a little bit more at the end of today's session. So I'd noticed nobody had this in the poll as anything that they, they, they dealt with they had an issue with the difference between receipts and payments or income expenditure but it's something that comes up reasonably regularly often when people come and join and subscribe one of our first questions might be which accounting approach do you use sometimes they don't know Sometimes they confidently answer and it turns out that they're using the other one, or sometimes they know what they're doing, but they might not know the terminology. They're quite comfortable with what they need to do, but they don't necessarily reflect it in what we're talking about. So just as a refresher, receipts and payments or income expenditure is one of the two approaches that you'll be using. So receipts and payments, simple form of accounts in that it records the receipts and payments at the time which they received or paid. So it's simply basically a record of your receipts and payments, your transactions, um, the date that when they were paid, regardless of when they relate to. So what happened, when it happened, regardless of when it related to. So you're just recording when, when it takes place. Okay, fairly simplistic, but makes things fairly straightforward with record recording in your cash book. Then you have income and expenditure. So that records transactions on the date to which it relates rather than when it was paid. So this may be more in line, particularly if you come from a more business financial background, this is what you're more likely to re recognise. And often the accounts will work on a receipts and payments basis throughout the financial year and then go through the conversion to income expenditure at the year end to take account of those things that relate to the year end in order to complete um, their ACAR in an income expenditure approach. In terms of which one you need to use, um, councils under 200,000 receipts and payments, so that's just a simple form that you can use there, and council over 200,000 need to use income expenditure, but that's only if it's been three consecutive years. So if you've had a year where you've gone over, even above 200,000, maybe because you've had a large grant, or you've had some still money come in that's pushed you over it, if you then go back under 200,000, that's either total income or total expenditure, um, in the following year, then you wouldn't need to go to income expenditure. It's only when it's been three consecutive years. Having said all that, though, a smaller council cannot to use IME. So if you are somebody who's more financially minded or you've got councillors like that, you may find that you will opt to use IME. And just a note there, if moving between approaches, be where the requirement to restate the prior year. So if you found yourself this year needing maybe to move up to INE, or you've made the decision to do so, or maybe move back to receipts and payments, then you will need to restate. So when you complete your year end AGAR, both your current year and your prior year and your accounting statements need to use the same accounting format. So do bear that in mind. If not this year, if it comes up again, that you'll need to restate.
So thinking about good procedures now then to keep on top of your accounts, we've kind of established why your account records are so important, not only for transparency, but for decision making, budget and preset setting, and obviously the year end as well, some things there that we need to consider. So the cash book, the most important accounting record for council, because all the information that you put into that cash book will be the bedstone of what you then produce in terms of your reporting. That information is then going to be able to produce your budget, your forecast, your budget versus actuals, your bank rec, your year-end reports. So it's absolutely vital that you have all the information that you need in your cash book, that it's obviously that it's accurate and it's easy then to extract the information from when you need it. So considerations then when keeping your cash book. Firstly, obviously regularly record payments and receipts. So that hopefully goes without saying that it's just keeping on top of it regularly. I think there were a couple of people at the start who mentioned that time was an issue and we get that a lot as well. Often if you're maybe the only employee at your council and maybe work part time, time can be a real constraint. But as much as you can, it's just keeping on top of it regularly recording those transactions and making sure you step out the VAT as that will then come back to help you later on when we talk about back claims and returns. Making sure you have a full audit trail, so your paperwork obviously ties up to the information that you're putting into your cash book, you have that supporting documentation, you've got the invoice information that you need in order to have that full audit trail with all the information that you can then refer to if you need to. Regular bank reconciliations to confirm your data is correct. So obviously doing that regularly means that the information that you're putting in your cash book, that's having further checks, making it sure that it balances to the bank. And obviously that's vital. Your starting point for the year end process is making sure you have a bank rec that balances to the 31st of March. Without it, you then can't do anything more for your year end. So that's absolutely key. And then when you're using your cash book and putting that information on, it's about thinking, can I produce timely and useful, useful information easily? So particularly now, has your year end process been really onerous? Have you not had all the information that you needed? Has it been quite hard to work with? So some things to think about, particularly now, since you're only in May, you know, your new financial year for 22, 23 is fairly young. So you've still got opportunities to think about how can I improve my cash book if it's actually making things quite difficult for me? So there's some things I've put there to think about. So firstly, is your accounting system fit for purpose? And so not only in terms of you getting the information that you want, but does it actually match to what it should be doing? Is it still on a standalone PC or laptop that might be locked in your office? You know, if the office burnt down, have you got a backup? Hopefully you're all keeping backups somewhere. So you've got that information that was lost. You could, you could restore it. Are you able to share it? With your councillors or other members that you might want them to see that information is that easy for them to come and have a have a read only access and have a look at the information that you've got there or are you having to do lots of additional work in providing reporting that you're then having to send around etc do you need training on it often we have people who come and join us from Skype and say I'm, I'm a new clerk and I join my council and I was given a laptop and a pile of paper and off I went and I had to go and work out you know what was going on how they kept their information and that can be very very difficult having to go back and work out you know what someone how someone does something and where they are at that point where they've left it is very tricky and I've helped lots of people who've had that sort of scenario and found that very very difficult so have you got a training documentation have you got access to it if you need to does somebody else know how to use it particularly if it's your own excel spreadsheet have you got anything that if you needed you, know, you left it or you handed it over have you got that information for them and does it suit the needs of your council so was it set up five ten years ago and it was absolutely wonderful but since then your council has changed maybe that person's moved on it's actually not really up to date you know maybe maybe it's on excel some cells are locked you can't amend it is it doing what you need it to do so when thinking about how you want to structure your cash book, there are some things there to think about um, in terms of basing it on your council budget or your preset breakdown. Now that sounds quite obvious. I think hopefully you've got a nice budget with your budget lines, your budget codes with each individual value against them. And often we get this as well when people come and join us at Scrub, they'll have a lovely budget and it'll be all itemised out, individual amounts per line. And then they'll have a cash book that's maybe on a spreadsheet, for example, that bears no resemblance to their budget. 
So actually trying to produce a budget versus actual report is really, really difficult because they're not allocating out their transactions to their budget lines. So make sure your cash book has those budget lines in them. You're allocating out your payments and out to those budget codes so that you can produce that information. If somebody comes and says to you, how much have we spent against this budget line? You can instantly look that column up or that line up, that code up, and you know where you were. Also thinking about grouping codes together that require reporting on. So for example, if you've got the village hall, you want to know what income have we had against the village hall, but what has it cost us to run it? What have we paid out in electricity, cleaning, maintenance, etc.? What's the overall position? Make sure you can group that together easily as well, if, particularly if you've got sort of committees or areas that want that information that you can provide it if that's the sort of thing that you think you might get asked. And in terms of the ways it could be improved upon, you might want to add additional codes to analyse the data further. So if you group lots of things into open spaces and that's your one code or budget line, would it be helpful to split it out? Grass cutting, hedges, trees, play park, rec ground, whatever it may be, would that then help you going forward in terms of analysing the budget in a bit more detail? Would that help you in terms of setting the precept because you can break it down? Would that be useful to report on that level of information? On the flip side, though, you might have this great long list of codes and sometimes people come and they have this huge long list and they actually do need all these and some of them they don't even use on an annual basis. So can you cut it down a little bit, make the report a little bit more succinct, succinct and make it a bit more useful? And also ensure that you've got all the information in the cash book that might be relevant to make it easier to refer to. So do you have the VAT number of your supplier easily accessible? Do you record the invoice date? For example, if that's something that you then have to refer back to your paperwork um, regularly, is that making more time unnecessarily? So if the supplier phones up and says, have you paid invoice number 72? Can you check that easily on the cash book? So think about those things and, and what, particularly at the end as well, what is difficult and what could you improve upon? Quick summary then in terms of the cash book. So setting aside time regularly, and identifying what information that you need to keep in order that you can provide the relevant reports that you need for your council meetings and your council might ask for information from you. Regular bank reconciliations. So we'd say ideally monthly to limit the scope for errors. So if you do it monthly, if you get a month that doesn't balance, you know you've only got one month to deal with. If you've done three months in one go, that's a lot of data that you then have to trawl back through. And there's a more general point there, think about maybe linking up with other clerks for advice and support. If you're finding that you're on your own in the council, you, you know, may be working part-time hours, those can feel quite overwhelming, particularly when you haven't got anyone else to ask a quick question of or look for support. So not just necessarily in terms of accounts or financial, but anything to do to be aware of, of that option as well. Moving on then to VAT, so I've put that in there because, again, this is something else that we get lots of questions about in terms of VAT. Obviously, if you have a particularly complicated VAT position or something going on, then it's always best to talk directly either to HMRC or get advice from a VAT specialist. But I'll just give you some, some overview and some points about being both VAT registered and non-VAT registered. Firstly then, VAT registered councils. So those will be councils who have an additional regular source of income besides their precepts. So for example, there you might be running a car park. So this is something else that's going on regularly that has a VAT implication to it and would achieve an after tax of £1,000 per annum. So roughly once you start charging for things regularly that would incur VAT and that gets to that level, you'd need to be looking at being VAT registered as a council. That will mean, therefore, that you need to submit VAT returns. That's normally done on a quarterly basis, but maybe on a monthly basis. And one word of advice as well, if you find yourself um, needing to register for VAT, try and make sure that your VAT quarters that you'll be submitting run in line with the year end, okay? Because it's a lot easier to manage if your end of the year, the 31st of March, matches to your quarter four, 31st of March as well. Just because it keeps things nice and easier, keeps things a bit neater, easier to check where you are. We have even a number of councils who, who straddle the year end, and that can just make things a little bit more complicated when working all that out. And be aware that you can change it. So if you are VAT registered and you have a quarter, don't match up, 
you can log on and amend it if you if you want to. So you must submit those VAT returns and now that must be done via making tax digital. So that was something that's been running for a few years that became mandatory for all VAT registered entities from April. Previously, there was sort of this grey area where you could be a council who was VAT registered because you wanted enough output tax to need to do so, but that you weren't over the £85,000 threshold to need to use MTD. So in that scenario, you were able to continue submitting your VAT returns on a paper basis, but that has now changed so from the start of this financial year, April to last month. It now is mandatory to use MTD if you're VAT registered. So if you are VAT registered, you will need to find some software that can submit your VAT returns to HMRC. Okay, so do be aware of needing to do that. The idea is that it increases accuracy, makes it that little bit easier because all the information that you've got in your software can then be extracted into the VAT return and then submitted directly to HMRC. Okay. So those some of the, you may not be VAT registered. So if you may be just the precept and you haven't got a lot of other sort of commercial type things going on and your regular income coming in, then you will be, you won't be VAT registered, but you can claim back VAT using Form 126 on the HMRC website. So I've put on the HMRC website there. So most of the time you'll be able to log in with your government gateway ID and do so. But if you haven't um, done that before, you can post it off if necessary. If you Google Form 126, you get a link if you want to post it off for the first time and then they'll set you up. So this is a lot less structured than being back registered. If you're back registered, you'll have your specific quarters that you must um, line up with and you must submit for the date that they provide you. Form 126 doesn't have any specific timings for claims, but it must be done for the complete calendar month, so you must get to the end of the month to claim to that point. But bear in mind as well, if you're smaller, claims less than £100 can only be done annually. So if you went to claim and it wasn't over £100, you'd have to wait for the full financial year in order to claim for it. Also be aware that claims can be made going back three years. So if you have inherited your position where they hadn't been claiming back the VAT, then that may be something that you want to look into. Obviously, there's a trade-off between how much time is it going to take me to go and find how much back we haven't claimed and put that information in. But if you're able to do so, then obviously that's helpful because that's money coming back um, into you if you want to. And in terms of claiming, as I said, because it's not structured, I'd recommend that you do add in your own structure. So at least annually, ideally up to the 31st of March, so in the same way as I was talking about, it's nice to keep it in line with year end. So if you're smaller, you haven't got that much back, then annually is absolutely fine. If not, I'd recommend you either do it six monthly or quarterly so that you know where you are. If you start doing it at random ad hoc month end dates, it can be a bit harder to keep track of it. And if you know that every quarter you do your back reclaim, it's easier to keep track of where you are. Okay, in terms of that, a bit more generally then, just to assist you in either your claims or your returns. So as we said at the start, ensure you record your VAT separately in your cash book. Obviously, that's going to make it a lot harder if you don't have that to be um, separated out. And councils be aware that they can only claim back the VAT if you've got that invoice. So that audit trail is important because you need to have that paperwork from your supplier. So they need to show the percentage or the amount of VAT that they're charging you. And you need to have the VAT number of the supplier as well on that invoice from them. Again, if it's long or onerous to do this, so along with anything, so we're talking about if your year-end is hard, if your VAT reclaiming is hard, think about how you can change it, how you can make that easier for you. Is it just a case of recording the VAT numbers when you put the information in rather than having to go back and looking them up, for example? How can you make those processes easier? And again, just to reiterate, take specialist advice if you do have a complicated VAT position. Okay, and then the last section I wanted to put in today, as I said at the start, is thinking about the year end, because it's likely that a lot of you will still be thinking about that um, now and working on that process. So just some pointers as we go through and think about what you're going to be putting in to the accounting statement section. The ACAR itself is made up of those three sections, the internal audit report, section one, the annual governance statement, and section two, the accounting statements. Now those first two, kind of a summary and, and sort of confirmation of, of hopefully that you're using those procedures and internal controls that I talked about at the start and that you're able to say, yes, those things are happening and the auditors come in and be able to answer those questions as well. So it's kind of an overview of what's happening, hopefully, 
without throughout your council um, month on month, year on year. And then section two, the accounting statement, the numbers, but the actual collation that you need to do from your cash book. And that's what I want to concentrate a little bit more on in this session, just because that's the sort of the, the where the work kind of is mostly involved in getting those numbers in those boxes. So here we go, then that's just an extract of this year's one. I'm sure you all recognise that and you've had that and you're merrily working on getting that information in there. Um, I hopefully also you've got the updated copy of the JPEG Practitioner's Guide and they now refer to these boxes as lines. So you'll have to excuse me because I'm going to use it interchangeably because I'm so used to saying boxes. I will likely say that, but lines is also true now um, as well. So in terms of going back to what we talked about earlier, in receipts and payments room from expenditure, the approach that you use will obviously have an effect on the way in which you complete the numbers in those boxes. So receipts and payments, because it's recording what happened, when it happened, regardless of when it relate to, relates to, you don't need to make any amendments to take account of timings. It's just taking those figures directly from the cash book. So once you've put that information in, you've checked its accuracy, you've reconciled it to the bank, you're pretty much there. Obviously, you've got to split it out to the relevant boxes, but those totals that you've got will be the totals that you'll be showing in the accounting statements. Those of you working in income expenditure will need to do a little bit more work. Okay, so firstly, VAT is excluded because it's going to constitute the debtor or the creditor. Either that is owed by you to HMRC or by HMRC back to you, and therefore that is not included in those boxes. So, for example, box six other payments will be gross if you're working in receipts and payments, but won't include that, so it'll be a net figure if you're an IME. And you also need to think about the adjustment that you're going to need to put through, such as for creditors and debtors. So this is going back to thinking about the timing that you need, so taking an account of what, when things should have happened, rather than necessarily when they did happen. So creditors are those invoices that you owe, for example, so suppliers where you've had goods or services provided to you up until the end of March, you put that information in to adjust that payment should have happened within that financial year. Or debtors, so if you raise invoices and you've got customers who haven't paid you for goods or services that you've provided to them, you would need to adjust for that as well. When you're doing those adjustments, a couple of things to think about. First is the materiality and the regularity. So you might want to set a level at which you adjust for, so everything over £50, £100, whatever it may be, consistent and stick to it. You, know, you might not want to get into every level of detail. If you know if you bought, you know, some staples and some pens, is it really worth putting in an adjustment for you know, five pounds stationery bill, for example? And also consider regularity as well. So if you pay something in arrears every month, if you're going to pay for March services in April, that might constitute a creditor. But actually, if you've got twelve months in the year itself already, then you wouldn't need to put it through. It's just getting that regular regular um, payments in. And obviously making sure that last year's adjustments are reversed. If you've got software, almost certainly that will happen for you. But if you use, do it manually or use a spreadsheet, then obviously making sure that what you put in last year's adjustment reverses that for this year and then is replaced by what you're, what you're adjusting for at the end of, end of the year itself. So as we said, then just some sort of quick thinking about the lines and, and the ego itself and, and pointers as we fill them in. Line one, balance is brought forward. Fairly obvious, making sure it's equal to box seven of the previous year. So make sure that you have what you submitted to the auditor for last year, and that is your starting position, particularly if you maybe had a couple of dry runs and those figures didn't necessarily end up to be the ones that you used. Or if you've restated, so obviously if you've changed some figures last year that's resulted in box seven being different, make sure you have the correct starting position as your box one. Line two, precepts rates or levies, so that's just the precept for councils, don't be confused by re reference to rates or levies, that's for drainage boards, so no still money or anything there, just the precept, and if you've re received the precept from your district authority with anything else alongside it, council tax support grant for example, make sure you exclude that, it's just the core payment of the precept that you've got in line two. Line three, total other receipts, so that's everything else um, that you've had in terms of income, except for the precept. But of course, not any bank transfers or movements of money. So if you've got accounts and you've moved one from the other, exclude that. And also be mindful if you've had credit notes, refunds back from suppliers, overpayments you've made to them, they've, they've given back to you. 
despite you might have received money, if you've had a payment back from a supplier that you've overpaid, that is a negative payment, not a receipt. It should not be in line three. Okay, so be aware of that. that any refunds that you've had from suppliers, you need to net off the original payment that you made in box six. And as we said, exclude that if you're working in line in box six. Line four is your staff costs. So being aware of guidance as to what can be included, that did change a couple of years ago. So hopefully you're all comfortable with that, but it is just the core staff costs of salary, pension, and tax. Nothing like training or mileage or um, payroll, so if payroll services, if somebody does it for you, those costs, they are line six costs. It's just the core staff cost that goes into line four. So you may have a scenario where what you report as your total staff costs in your actual budget lines is different to what goes in box four because you need to exclude some of those things on the periphery, such as training. Line five is your loan interest, capital repayments, fairly self-explanatory. Obviously, that's separate from box line six, so any loan repayments. And then line six, all other payments, so that's everything else. Okay, and on the flip side, same way as I talked about with receipts, no bank transfers, movements of money, and obviously, if you've paid a customer back, so if the customer has paid you something that you've then refunded, despite the fact that you've paid them, it is not a payment, it is a negative receipt. Okay, so just making really sure that you understand how refunds work and how they should show it. So if it's a reverse of what happened originally, it's a negative entry against that original, original item. And again, the back's included in I and E. Line seven then, this is your sum of one, two, and three. So your opening position plus your precept plus your other receipts, less your payments of staff costs, loan repayments, and other payments. So making sure that it tots up. Now, again, that sounds fairly self-explanatory, but quite recently I've been talking to somebody whose last year didn't actually add up. Box seven was correct, but the individual boxes didn't actually add up. Something had been missed from one of the boxes, so it didn't actually sum. And then line eight is the total value of your cash in your short-term investment. So this is your bank, right? This is your 31st of March. 31st of March bank requisition. And as I said at the start, it should be your starting point when you come to produce your year-end accounting. That needs to be your starting point. Your bank rec as at the 31st of March, matching off to line eight. And if you are in receipts and payments, box eight, line eight will be the same as seven. But if you're an income expenditure, seven and eight will be different by the value of your creditors and your debtors. So your adjusting items that we talked about because you've taken into account in those individual boxes, what should have happened and made adjustments, but you've not updated the actual bank position, which stays as it does according to the bank rec. Line nine then is your fixed assets and long-term investments. Obviously make sure you've updated for any assets or disposals that have happened in this year. So you've added an asset, bought an asset, you've added it on. If you've disposed an asset, you've taken it off. No depreciation, that sometimes comes up as a question, If you, particularly if you've come from a commercial background. There is no depreciation, you just record the asset at the point at which you purchased it. So if you bought one this year, it would appear in box six as the payment and then box nine because it's now added onto the asset register. Okay, And make sure you've obviously got your asset register with all that information in there. Any old assets that you've inherited or taken on would have your proxy pound value and they don't revalue them, it's just that core cost um, initially. So it's likely that you'll have a separate insurance schedule for what assets are actually worth, but box nine, line nine, record the original acquisition cost in this case. And then line 10, borrowing. So this is the amount that you owe if you have any loans and it must match to the schedule. So again, just making sure your line 10 um, matches up to what you have on your schedule that's owing for your, for your loan. In terms of your supporting documentation, depends whether you're in receipts and payments or I and E. So everybody will need to do your bank rec to agree to line eight, as we talked about. Reconciliation between seven and eight, just for those in I and E to explain how seven is different to eight due to your debtors and your creditors. And also you've got explanation and variances. So if it's relevant, if you've got variances over 15% for lines two, three, four, five, six, nine, and 10, or if line seven is more than twice line two. So line seven is your total funds. Line two is your precept. So if you're holding more than double the precept, it's likely that almost certainly that you've got large reserves. And that's absolutely fine. You just need to be clear about explaining that breakdown so that they can understand why you've got so much um, additional above, over and above the precept in terms of funds that you're holding. 
okay and do make sure you give your full numerical explanations you want to give a breakdown of exactly what's happened rather than just sort of a textual explanation it's a bit vague give some numbers and some explanations so that they can the auditor can um, exactly match it off to what's happened and the differences that you're reporting okay so that's everything i wanted to talk about today i hope you found that useful i will stop sharing now and i will hand back to john john you're muted oh yes <laughs> thank you everybody uh, thank you hannah we'll go to questions in a minute um before we do that i would like to just uh talk you through um let me just click that Yes, yeah, so at Scribe, we talk to hundreds of parish and town councils, clerks, RFOs every year. And as a result, the team have made some observations about the situation that local councils often find themselves in. So we, we've come up with three recommendations. Hannah's been touching on slightly there about mastering accounting process. First off, what I'd like to talk about with a model that we've come up with. Um, so we put together this concept of the council accounting hierarchy of needs. And we believe if uh, RFOs and clerks follow this basic model, they'll have a stress free experience. So I'll just talk you through it down at the bottom layer. This is like core foundational layer, which encompasses all your core daily or maybe weekly ideally daily it depends on the site how much activity in your council uh, activities so that's taking care of your cash book as hannah said there you know so it's inputting your receipt your payment constantly reconciling with your bank and being able to do your vat claims so building on that then we need to monitor our budget versus our forecast so taking care of our spending tracking that spending and that budget tracking that committed spend, producing your summary report based on your cash book to see that you are achieving the forecast that you planned. And then that kind of feeds into sharing your data with external stakeholders, you know, so the government auditors, you know, taking care of your VAT, your account statements, and ultimately producing, you know, doing your ACOP. And that, you know, again, then leads into the ultimate goal of accountability, where you publish your results to the public and share, you know, how you are managing uh, public funds and sharing that public funds. But in reality, you know, sometimes in reality, it's not easy to follow that ideal workflow it doesn't really happen and again from talking to hundreds of local councils we can see a problem here and we've been calling it the cash book crisis which you know again hannah you know highlighted that in a sl slides you know that we're seeing many councils not investing not the time and not also having the right tools to have a good cash book process this is foundational layer and you know it feeds into the monitoring the government's near accountability so if you have a good foundation there then um you, you're setting yourself up for success but you know to be able to do your VAT claims your budget reporting and your agar these all become daunting tasks and that stress and anxiety can build up and you know it's coming and then boom everyone leaves it to the last minute so the first recommendation we're going to have is always think cash book first, you know, Hannah's made it clear. Think about that year end goal throughout the year and that cash book contributes, you know, to, you know, if you have it in a good place, it contributes to your monitoring, your governance and your accountability. However, we think there aren't any real simple and accessible systems to manage your cash book so this leads me into second recommendation is use scribe you know scribe is really easy to use and it comes with that free training and unlimited support to support you through that process because the the, the slides that you know hannah's talked through there it is overwhelming and it is quite a lot of information to take on board uh, you know and throughout your year having someone there to give you support is really important now the key thing is you can access it anywhere you can give access to unlimited users your counselors read only access your auditors um, because it is cloud-based and it ensures you're compliant but really the cool thing about scribe is as long as you just take care of this foundational layer and it's really easy to use that then these two next 
layers in it are basically at a click of a button. All you have to do is a click a button to do your your VAT reclaim, do your making tax digital, produce your uh, budget versus forecast reports, produce your agar statement, uh, uh, your account statement for agar. All of this comes at a click of button. So you just take care of your daily work, and then it all comes basically for free. So you know you, you've got to ask yourselves. If, I don't know how much time you guys. Uh, put aside for doing those parts of the process, you know, um, producing your reports for your council meetings and then doing your year end. If you had to add up all that time, do you, do you think it's a day or a week, two weeks, a month in a whole year uh, or more? How much time are you dedicating to doing all these functionalities that come for free for Scribe? So, you know, we've got a really good example here with Sally she, uh, Ferguson. She joined us and she then had, she had, you know, spending less time managing the accounts. So then she got really good at grants. She spent a lot of time applying for grants. You know, she's only on a, a precept of 16K and she was able to secure grants of 52K. So it's a massive multiple on her actual income. And with that, she was able to employ, you know, lo local youngsters to work at the cafe. She was able to extend the hour. So that's a really good example of, you know, freeing up time. What, you know, what would you do with that time if you got it back? Um, my third recommendation is to yeah, download this uh, year-end checklist that we've done for you. It's actually a bit more than a year-end checklist. You know, we've got the, you know, but it, it kind of aligns you with that thinking. Think cash book first so that you can prepare for the year-end. We also put in some good accounting habits in there, your daily, monthly, quarterly, and annual tasks. So I've just dropped it in this in the chat there that you can go ahead and download that. So um, finally, you know, again, it goes back to that support. It can be a daunting task managing public funds. At Scribe, we have a great team of qualified accountants that they're always there to support you. So, you know, if you want to know more about what, what we're doing, want to know if we can help you further, feel free to, um, you know, just drop yes in the chat and we'll, we'll call, you know, uh, no obligations, give you a call and show you our product. Good day and take it easy and I'll see you later.